Um, you know, my portion will be um, brief. Uh, I want to echo a lot of points that you know Jim Carafano, Dr. Carafano made, but from slightly different perspective. This is uh, if this is uh, like a, you know some kind of box uh, in front of us. We want to take a, this loop. Perhaps we need to take a, this loop too, so that we can have a bigger picture in a way. Um, let me take a half step back. Uh, my name is Anthony Kim, right? So Kim is obviously Asian name, and it's an undeniable Korean name. The big, big question is, is this Kim from North part or Southern part? Right? <laughs> there are two Koreans. Right? So obviously, you know, I was born in Seoul, but now, you know, I'm an you know, uh, American citizen. My point, the reason I'm talking about my background here is Kim. I think Romania has a very interesting and unique stake here concerning Asia, and especially concerning Northeast Asia. You still have a diplomatic relationship with North Korea. Your embassy is there, and then whatever happens in Northeast Asia, either China or Korea concerned, I think Romania will play a certain role. How big, how small, we don't know yet. How indirect, how direct, we don't know yet, but you do have your presence and function. So your natural interest in Asia, especially Northeast Asia, China, Korea, and that part of the world, is very much uh, 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 expected and natural, and it will continue. Now, as a person who's coming from Asia, Korea, I can tell you when we discuss China, China is quite different. Actually, it's very different from Russia and you know, so former Soviet Republic. And China, the entire history of China is not really you know, happy and sunny and you know, very much positive. This is a history of uh, struggles, a lot of internal instability, a lot of humiliation and a lot of bad things. It's only in recent decades, maybe since 1970s, you know, when China was trying to open up its economy, 80s and 90s and 2000s. Now, nowadays, China is economically far better. A lot of people are out of poverty. But still, the country is not really People's Republic of China. It's neither People's nor Republic. This is a communist party-driven, almost dictatorial, authoritarian country, period. So one thing I want to make sure is that when we, we meet in Washington and when we, all of us, when we talk about China, I think we probably want to say, when we talk about China, we are not really against Chinese people. We are not against really ordinary Chinese businessmen or just people there middle class, what we are really concerned when we talk about the issue of China, I think it's a really CCP, China's Communist Party, and their vision, the world view and whatever. And now Xi Jinping is basically the king of China. You know, he doesn't have any uh, uh, term limits. He can be forever king of China, and he's been accumulating all the powers, political, economic, and military powers. And China is not really Soviet Union and even Russia because, you know, people talk about Cold War and all that. But back in old days, when we had a, the first version of the Cold War, the Soviet Republic, Soviet Union wasn't really a part of the globalized economy. It was its own. They didn't really have any meaningful economic power. It was a military power. They were very uh, ambitious in terms of their agenda, propaganda, you know, territorial uh, uh, ambition. But China we are dealing with is really global economic power we cannot even know. I think that's the big difference in this second version of the Cold War. It's really plugged into global supply chain, global market, energy, whatever small things, they are like the hub of whatever manufacturing stuff. So that's a very different difference. And that's, I think, the competitive and strategic advantage the Beijing and CCP will try to maximize. And they've been doing it you know, over the past 20 years since they became the member of the WTO. Now, insert 
somebody named Trump, and he came in, and among many other things, you know, you can talk about bad or ugly or good or fantastic. What he did was, guys, wait a minute, wait a minute. No, 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 no. I don't think this is, uh, uh, this is right. I don't think this is uh, what we want. To me, I think essentially that's what he did. He just said, wait a minute, let's take a look where things are. What are you doing, China? What are you doing, Beijing? What are you doing? Right? Until that moment, Washington was busy with, hey, China, welcome to the world community. We want to embrace you. Let's work together. Hey, handshake. Hey, have this dinner with us, you know, toast, you know. While Beijing and CCP, while they've been milking everything America has and can offer, and in the name of, you know, peaceful coexistence, in the name of helping China's peaceful rise, I think Washington, in a way, kind of gave a lot of uh, space to Beijing. And Beijing, mm -hmm. obviously, it's a CCP-driven country, right, China. And in the name of maintaining this huge, populous country, they just took strategic advantage of utilizing and undermining Washington's power and influence around them. And that's where we are, and then Trump said, no, 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 that's not right, we gotta, we gotta take another look at it, we gotta review where we are, you know, let's talk about things. And that's, I think, you know, in a nutshell, to make a long story short, I think that's where we are today. So, we have a different president in Washington, right, in, in the United States. President Biden, to me, he basically downloaded Push the button, downloaded the entire China playbook from Team Trump. I don't see any difference between Biden's and Trump's. I mean, it's the same tough stance. And basically, we cannot go back to pre Trump US China relationship era. That time is over. I think Beijing is really realizing it. And if you look at Congress in the United States, they are united. They are united against you know, CCP, not against Chinese people once again. The Congress in the United States, more than ever, I think they are united. They want to really take a different approach when it comes down to dealing with China, period. Now, that, that opens up really new chapter. China didn't expect this. China thought that everything will go on according to their grand master plan. Again, coming from Asia, I can tell you, Chinese, they always think and play long game. You know, this is not like a buy next year. You know, for them, do whatever you want to do. We'll wait. You know, Chinese, like a Chinese version of chess, go. It's a very strategic long game. It's not like overnight, over whatever, you know. So they're like, watch, and that's been what's been going on. But right now, they have this dilemma and problem. So Xi Jinping's two mandate is very clear. Getting Chinese people, China, this big country, united under his authority and power and CCP, at the same time, making the Chinese economy keep growing so that people can work, people don't complain, and people just do whatever CCP instruct and monitor. But these two mandates are not really easy to keep, especially in this global environment. Pandemic, supply chain disruptions, and all the negative uh, perceptions and actual action against China. So global environment, China is facing today is far worse than previously they hoped for. And that's reality, that's undeniable reality. So my conclusion, quasi-conclusion for our discussion is, I think we'll see more turbulence coming out of Beijing, out of China. I mean, there are only limited things that we can actually inject into uh, you know, Chinese uh, behavior, in terms of changing Chinese behavior. But I think the bigger problem we may not know yet, or we may not really get into at this point is 
China's internal tension and, 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 and struggle. And then you earlier you mentioned Washington used to talk about how to deal with China's you know, rising. But now people are thinking, of, oh, it's equally problematic how China is really descending. I think to me, the real problem is how we deal with the, this declining China economically and then politically, internally, because it's inevitable. China is not immune from its own economic and financial crisis. I mean, we cannot expect China will grow over 6%, 7% forever. Now the growth rate is coming down to under 5%. And let's see how China's financial market and property markets will be performing. No other country on earth it had been immune from economic crisis, thus political crisis. Once China gets into this stage of crisis, real crisis, economic crisis, I think the, the whole equation will be much more complicated. And I think that it will be the really about how to survive, how to make this huge populous country keep going. Thus, I bet China will be a lot more nationalistic, a lot more inward looking, and therefore I'm a bit more, I'm more concerned about China-Taiwan relationship, the tension, the potential conflict than many others probably. Because I think if there's only single word China can trigger will be to war against Taiwan in the name of uniting Chinese people. And also let's remember, whatever Chinese military might, they haven't been fighting. You know, the last actual whatever, you know, regional global war was the Korean War. But there was also the extension of China's internal whatever instability uh, uh, issue, uh, internal struggle. China wasn't like, you know, going out like doing a war in, in, in the Middle East or any other parts of the world. They've been developing their weapons and all that, but they do not have actual fighting members. But if there's only one can come out anytime soon, I'm afraid that may well be you know, the Taiwan issue, again, in the name of uniting Chinese people and unification. So we'll see, but I think that China will get into uh, its own internal turbulence, whether political or economic or combined, most likely. So it will be a very much a new chapter for not only the U.S.-China relationship, European Union-China relationship, but China's own internal changes. And next year happens to be 20th year of China's uh, you know, very important uh, political calendar, a 20th uh, Chinese Communist Party platform or something, where Xi Jinping will further solidify uh, his authority and power. So I think Xi Jinping is under pressure. So I'll just put it that way and then invite your questions. Thank you very much. Uh, and uh, well, the floor is yours now. Can a session? So if you have questions or comments or but before we actually, while you are formulating your questions, let me invite my Dr. Kerfan. Did you, how did you see this, you know, my, my approach towards the China in front of problems? Well, you know, the, this is, you know, kind of the, the what you guys were expert on, the, the key thing of international relations, which are the, the different dynamics which could forward different trajectories and why we have I think Taiwan's a good place to start this kind of vociferous debate about how does the Taiwan issue fit into China's um, interests and, and how do they play that. So we often hear about the, the potential scenario, which is a, a fair one, that would there be a, I mean, you know, one is would they, you know, seize Taiwan out of strength, right? So this is, but, but I think the, the that doesn't make a whole lot of sense because it's much more likely that they would follow the successful formula, which was the Hong Kong scenario, which was eventually the influence was so great, it was expanded, it was incremental at some point, it was just theirs. Um, this was, this, I think, this, the strategy in the South China Seas. 
And so if it's a China, if it's a rising China, a growing China, I think military conflict is less likely because I think the, the notion is is they will they would they would um, eventually overwhelm and they play the long game and take Taiwan. So the alternative scenario which you possibly is well what happens if it's a falling China and there is failure and distraction, would they then you know seize Taiwan because uh, this would unite the people and it would show that they're still strong. So um, I know a country that tried that. Uh, it was it was it was Chile, right? Um, in the season of the Falklands, it didn't work out so well. The, the Hunter was Junta was very unpopular, and so they they thought that they would seize the Falkland Islands. It would be a great national endeavor. Um, unfortunately, the British actually fought back. Things didn't go so well, and what they actually did was rapidly precipitate the, the collapse of the regime. Um, this this would I think be something in the back of the Chinese mind that. Um, Doing a, a you know a war of distraction uh, would um, you know allow them to kind of push away their, their things. So one of the problems with that is, is um, as as the Chile is when you're or Argentina, sorry, as the Argentinians show it is when when you're disunited at home and you start to do wars, that that might not actually work so well. And the other thing is, is what happens if the other guy fights back? I mean, as you rightly pointed out. The one thing we know about the Chinese is they don't have a tremendous amount of operational experience in actually using their military. What they mainly use their military for is for domestic security activities and in the policing things, they have not done big operations. That's why, for example, the Chinese participated in, um, in anti-piracy operations uh, in the Middle East. Mm -hmm. It was it was in large part to give them operational experience in operating far from home, um, and now they have a base, so operating on an extended basis. So they're trying to develop these kind of capabilities. One of the things that they do with the, the Taiwan overflights, which is interesting, is Taiwan overflights are not a new thing. There were like 300 and something of them last year, but they did like 150 in three days. <laughs> which was a demonstration of the ability to mass aircraft, to do all the command and control. So they are trying to develop that. But, but it's a risk for them. To fight a major war um, means that they would actually have, this would be their first time out of the box doing that. They haven't done this since Korean War. And the Taiwanese could fight back, and the, and the Taiwanese might not be a pushover. And if you didn't win right off the bat, that could be a, be a real problem for you. So, um, uh, I, I think that raising that point is really interesting. The other thing that's really important that you raise is what we when we tend to talk about China is we've been so vociferous about getting people to recognize that this is a global challenge and potentially a threat to global prosperity and, and peace and, and um, international norms that oftentimes by emphasizing the threat of China, we don't talk a lot about the weaknesses of China and their limitations. Um, and, and I do think we have to balance that conversation. So I, I thought your, your comments were, were really helpful. And I want to note that in Asia, I mean, again, just I mean, let's limit this discussion, this portion to Asia. If you look at modern political history, modern meaning since 1990 something, not like the 1970 or 80, all the female political leaders in Asia, they miserably, miserably failed. Um, South Korea used to have a president, Madam Park. She's now in jail. She couldn't even finish her term. And then late, you know, early 2000, there was a Thai prime minister, also female. She got into this whole political corruption scandal. So she's like, a, she couldn't finish her term. And Burma, Myanmar, there's a one time, you know, not one time, many times before she became the head of the country, Aung San Suu Kyi. She was a great, but now her fate is really fizzled. Uh, she didn't really deliver, and then she's now in a different fate. Hong Kong, let's consider Hong Kong as a sort of independent, whatever, territory. The Carrie Lam, the chief executive, again, female, you know, she, she was saying that, oh, I can, I can make Hong Kong better, yeah, Beijing, but we can do. But now she's totally subject to Beijing's influence. <laughs> now there's one current and acting, not acting, the current 
uh, a political leader in Asia. That's a Taiwan's president. Again, female. So it's her second term. I'm just saying that, you know, I hope she doesn't, you know, get into this kind of similar ill-fated, you know, finer stage of, you know, her presidency. Again, this is a second term. I hope there's no war, but who knows, you know. And also, I want to point out that if there's any war triggered by Beijing, that will be a global PR disaster for China. I mean, how can China, you know, either winning or losing, it doesn't really matter. Just this big country getting into Taiwan to win the war and killing people, and then try to maintain its global economic power status. I don't think that can match. I don't think that can be sustained. I think that will be global PR nightmare for Beijing. I think then their economic power will be really meaningless at that point. Anyways, that's Yeah, I think uh, just the, the short observation, yeah, proper war, maybe, but what about the hybrid war? Because maybe the Chinese are looking at the at the Falkland, the Argentina, and But what about Russia and Crimea in 20? Right. <laughs> So it, it, it is more, uh, could be, could be their, uh, uh, one of uh, maybe their favorite example, right? Mm -hmm. So in China, uh, in Russia, I mean in Crimea, there was not a proper war, right? And uh, apparently very successful I mean, for regime, for Mr. Vladimir Putin. Uh, okay. Um, the question over there. What, uh, Mr. Kim has argued that. Uh, Please identify yourself. And, uh, yeah. <laughs> Mr. Kim has argued that uh, the United States um, has given a lot of space to, to China. I think uh, the same holds true for the European Union, who uh, in 2019 defined uh, China um, in different ways as uh, economic partner, um, as uh, strategic rival, or uh, um, a systemic rival. Um, in my view, um, the policies regarding China of both the United States and uh, the European Union are heavily influenced by these strategic representations um, they come up with uh, regarding China. Um, what's, um, what's new in this regard um, in the case of uh, the Biden administration? Uh, the Biden administration uh, has come up with a, a strategic definition which somehow uh, is between uh, the one the Obama administration has come up with and uh, the one specific to uh, the Trump administration. My point is that uh, um, in the view of the Biden administration, China is a strategic competitor who has um, sufficient uh, technological, economic and political cap capabilities to unsettle uh, the stability of the international system. Um, in, in your view, uh, what has changed in comparison to uh, the strategic perspective of the Trump administration regarding China? Can I look at sure. I would uh, give the first one, yeah, yeah. And, and what, what about this 3C strategy? Because you already mentioned the strategy, so if you want to answer. Yeah, so look, I, um, I I think we have to acknowledge that the strategic perspective in the West with the United States and Europe has evolved mm -hmm. to a pretty significant degree. We had for two decades the competing debate about a rising China between you know the panda huggers and the panda haters, right? And, and it was the contrasting arguments between um, the Chinese Communist Party is fundamentally authoritarian. As they gain more power, they're going to become more authoritarian. If you actually read the Chinese writings, the rise of China is going to be destabilizing. And the contrasting view was, no, you know, we believe that as China rises, it will become a responsible stakeholder 
it will normalize, and uh, and the key and, the, and what's really important is engagement. Um, that debate's over. Right? Nobody thinks that the solution to dealing with China is the normalization of China through engagement. Nobody believes that anymore. Um, that's that's actually a pretty significant evolution. Um, I actually think what what Trump brought to the stage was the confirmation of that. You know, I think it might have happened, to be honest, under any any president that, that the time had just come, and we had and and. And, and I think what Anthony said, which I think is correct, is that if there is continuity between a Trump and a Biden, we're, we're not going back to that, right? We're not going back to the framework of, of really the Bush-Obama years, of, of let's hope we can figure out how to normalize China. And, and in that respect, I think that's right. And, 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 I, and he's right, I think that, that it's bipartisan in both Republicans and Democrats that that's true as well. Um, the the question is is that okay if we're going to compete with China how do we compete right and that's where there is a big debate um, there, and there are differences between Trump and Obama and there are differences and Biden and there are differences between Trump and Biden and the Europeans the Trumpian model was essentially to be in your face. So rather than, than minimizing the elements of disagreement, which is which was the old model, right? Like minimize the disagreement, focus on the things that we can work. Trump flipped the the, the game on its head. He he focused on the areas that we disagreed with the Chinese. And he said that the the quickest way to stability was to look the Chinese in the face and say, I disagree on this, and you're going to recognize my equities, and then we'll be OK. Um, the, the Biden administration has, in a sense, flipped back to the Obama script, not, not trying to normalize China, but to try to reach stability with China through a, um, through a formula that is less confrontational. And it's compete where we must and then cooperate where we can. Um, the, the problem that the Biden administration is having is there's plenty of areas to compete. And, and, and in fairness, again, elements of continuity of the Trump administration, they've done that. Taiwan's a very good example. Biden administration's been very good on Taiwan. They, they've honored all the commitments. They've actually increased the number of high-level US um, officials going there. Uh, they show no slackening of support for Taiwan. Um, that's very consistent with the Trump administration. But they, they, you know, kind of going back to the Obama administration, which is not surprising since it's many of the same people. Um, there's a they said, well, we looked, we need to look for areas to cooperate, mm -hmm. um, and you know, primarily they look at climate change, which of course is a just a non-starter because. The, the Chinese are never going to really cooperate on climate change. They're not going to cooperate on strategic arms. Um, the problem with the cooperate part is it's just not going anywhere. Where I think this leads us, I think eventually the, the United States will do is they will turn back to working with partners because that's where they have room. So it's not going to be about cutting deals with the Russians and the Chinese because they're not going to find good deals to cut. And, and here's, I think, where, where countries like Romania are, are, yes. are really, really important. Um, you know, I know, and this administration's tendency is they want to talk to Brussels, they want to talk to Berlin, they want to talk to Paris, and then you guys take care of the rest of the Europeans. Mm -hmm. I don't think that part is very sustainable either. I, I think in the one of the ironies of great power competition is that small powers actually matter more in great power competition. And I, I think that's for three reasons. One is because geography still matters. And when great powers come together, the, at the important strategic inflection point, people, you're competing over space. So Romania is actually a, a really good example of that. Romania, unfortunately, sits in a very strategic place in the Black Sea. The Black Sea is important to the regional stability. 
Romania is going to be important. People are going to want Romania on their side. That's just a fact. Um, I think in, in, in competition, you, you want the more like-minded your partners are, the, the better and more reliable partners they are. Romania is a free market democracy uh, that recognizes the value of freedom. Um, that's a better partner for the United States uh, than a country that doesn't. And the thing is, in, in the end, I think small powers um, actually can bring more to the table um, than again, and, 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 and their contributions you know, out, outweigh what they bring. I think, again, I think Romania is an example of that. Romania has been a net contributor to regional security. So, um, so I think countries like Romania do have an important role to play, and I think what's going to happen is the United States is increasingly going to find itself turning to these partners because, because that's the space they're going to have to operate in to, to help mitigate Chinese competition. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I'll get some. We have one more question here. No, 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 just, just, just let me go. It's kind of a question clarification because you said, well, the previous administrations did have a strategy, right? I mean, well, it failed, but to get China WTO in 2001, it was a strategy, right? And 25, it was triggered, right? It was China becoming a responsible stakeholder, right? It was a strategy, right? It was, yeah. Okay. okay. But apparently today, we don't believe anymore that China could become a responsible stakeholder. So is it any chance, theoretically at least, to have China as a responsible stakeholder? If yes, we should follow that path. If not, we should do something completely different, right? right. What would be the, 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 the option the US has? I mean, go back to Truman, <laughs> in Cold War, it's not possible because mm -hmm. apparently China is too global, right? Mm -hmm. So if, if you don't believe anymore that China could become a responsible stakeholder, that would be problematic, right? We have to deal with this one. Yeah, another, right? yeah and this is an international and relationship. Second, uh, so yeah, yeah. And the second question, what if EU still believes that China could become a responsible stakeholder and try to use, you know, this path, you know, economic, whatever, in order to not necessarily to appease China, but to deal with China mm -hmm. and uh, letting, you know, China, US alone in his you know, hard <laughs> approach. So, so. No, it's like, this, is, this isn't even international relations. This isn't about being a realist. This is just about being realistic, right? Yeah. <laughs> so so the, the, rea the reality is, is China is not using its global influence to be a responsible stakeholder. And that's not going to change. So you know, international organizations are a very good example. As China's influence has expanded in international organizations, it has not used that influence and power to strengthen those organizations, it's used it to subvert it and, and bend it to support Chinese influence. And as, as long as you, as anybody pretends that just engaging with China is going to lead to better outcomes, then the, the Chinese are going to take advantage of you. It's just that simple. And we, we just have irreversible evidence for that. And as long as we have the same president and yes. the same regime, the likelihood of that changing is is zero. I, I really echo that. I think here, let's be simplistic. Well, not like, a, I mean, this is a big, big issue when I say let's be simplistic, meaning let's get to the point. As long as we have Xi Jinping in Beijing, I don't think we can expect China becomes gradually, whatever way, a responsible stakeholder in the global community, period. Xi Jinping is the king of China. As long as he is in charge, China will not change at all. Now, you mentioned 2001 WTO, you know, we talked about that. Back then, in Beijing, there are factions of the reform-minded. They want to change China. They want to open up China. They want to modernize China. They want to upgrade China with a better human rights values and everything, democracy, to a certain degree, while maintaining kind of CCP structure. But today's China, that's completely gone. They've been all purged. The small circle, the reform circle China, Beijing used to have is almost non-existent in today's setting. It's really about China. It's really about the pride this, this country has. It's really about Xi Jinping, and it's really about the, 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 the existence and survival of the CCP. That's the essence. 
And that's the big difference between you know, the beginning of this century and where we are now. And that's the, 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 the dilemma and that's the battleground in my opinion.